This is our last discussion coming up. And just one brief announcement, a talk which had previously been scheduled earlier and was not given is going to be given this afternoon. So the discussion, the discussion section here will last for just 30 minutes rather than 45 minutes. So we'll start right now and we will continue now until 415. At that point, Tim Robershaw will chair the final, the final uh, session. Okay, somebody lost this. This is a Go Walking by Sportline. I'm not actually even sure what it is, but anyone lose this? Okay, maybe not. Well, I'll leave it up here on the podium and hope that its rightful owner finds itself. Okay, this being the last discussion period of the, the whole meeting, I guess in principle we could um, discuss anything we like. Well, of course, we can do that anyway. <laughs> Uh, I don't have a, a list of things for the screen, as, as Enrique did, or some other discussion leaders. I'm going to leave it a little bit more open. Uh, one, uh, several questions that come to my mind that don't necessarily need to be uh, uh, discussed, or could be, depending on the group's preference. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, linear polarization observations earlier today, some of them very stunning. Some of these new ALMA observations are really astonishing in terms of their uh, detail and quality and so forth. Uh, the question that came to my mind is what, what, what fundamental astrophysical questions have we uh, been able to answer on the basis of linear polarization studies of star forming regions and uh, where do we stand now and wh where should we go in the future? That is to say what questions uh, of astrophysical significance uh, broadly speaking could be uh, answered by uh, future observations of linear polarization in uh, star forming regions. Each map of linear polarization is very complicated, uh, a wealth of different features, and uh, we were told about various simulations that can be done, and the simulations often look uh, to some extent like the observations, but what are the fundamental questions that we can answer, uh, or have been answered, or could be answered in the future? So the question of the overall significance, uh, broadly stated, of linear polarization maps of star forming regions is one thing that we could uh, we could discuss. Another question unrelated, uh, Dick Crutcher brought this up to me just a few minutes ago, uh, the question of the connection between the magnetic field and the gas density. Uh, different uh, different uh, simulations have brought about perhaps different answers to that question. If B is proportional to N to the kappa, what is the value of kappa? Uh, observations seem to suggest that the value of kappa in that scaling relationship between field strength and gas density is of order two-thirds. Some simulations uh, reproduce that, others reproduce uh, flatter uh, connections between the field, lower values of kappa between the field and the density. Is there something fundamental there? Uh, are the differences in this scaling law something that is uh, related perhaps to the details of the numerical simulation, or is it something that's fundamental here? That's another question. And finally, we could talk about diffusion. We have ambipolar diffusion, reconnection diffusion, even our ever favorite numerical diffusion. So maybe there's some issues that can be brought up. So uh, without a more formalized list, uh, I'm open to any uh, thoughts or comments about linear polarization, diffusion, the scaling law between uh, magnetic field strength and gas density, or anything else you wish to talk about. Okay, yeah, I, I had a feeling, I had an intuition, I'm very intuitive, that Alex would uh, be more than happy to lead things off. Yes, please. Uh, I can uh, uh, tell my thing, uh, thinking about uh, polarization. And uh, I believe it's very important to know how dense gas and uh, um, diffuse gas are related and what the polarization can give us uh, a very good idea about that. We can also find out uh, the structure of magnetic field, whether magnetic field is uh, irregular in um, GMCs or cores, which would uh, suggest that we have uh, really very low importance of magnetic field for uh, supporting uh, clouds. So I believe um, it is very important also to combine uh, extinction and um, uh, emission polarization. So because we can 
test uh, ideas uh, about diffuse gas, probably better with uh, extinction polarization and then uh, connect them with uh, emission polarization within the, the gas. And there has been very few, in fact, uh, papers on that subject. And I don't want to talk about uh, a connection and bipolar and diffu numerical diffusion, otherwise everyone would be thinking that uh, I have uh, a craziness about that. <laughs> Alex has a craziness, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, yes, please, Graham. I think what's happening, I mean, it's sort of related to what Alex is saying in terms of large scales, and getting down to small scales. I think the problem is happening when we are with Alma is when we are going down to really small scales, you know, tens to 100 AU type of scales and looking at the fields on those scales. And that's when things get, I think, very complicated. I mean, stuff far away, larger scales, I mean, stuff that Karma has seen, SMA has seen, uh, and uh, so on have been, have been complicated, but still you could follow trends much more easily. It's the things that Chad showed and stuff that uh, that Paolo has shown that those are and just a Mikel that that you know in very fine scales things look much more messy and we're starting to get only a few now so far I mean we have maybe a total of a half a dozen Alma observations I think we need more and I think theory theory is also proceeding I mean simulations and I, I, I think the connection will be a little bit more obvious I think slowly later on. Right now, we don't have enough objects to be able to constrain theories well. And you know, as observers, you look for theories to be provided. But it, I think it'll take some time. And I think Alma, when the chat rightly says, and the Alma re revolution has just begun. And, but I think the one thing which is missing so far from Alma and which will happen in the future is uh, we don't have, I mean, Alma is, again, looking at these fine scales, but it's not telling us the fields on larger scales, structures on larger scales. And for that, perhaps we need you know, the, the ACA polarization to be available. And uh, so I think that will connect on larger scales. Uh, what is a question do you think that could be answered? Well, let's suppose in the future we have 25 maps of, uh, of linear polarization on a few tens of AU scale okay. or whatever the scale okay. that Alma provides. Depends on the distance of the object, obviously. Suppose we have 25 yeah. maps like that. What would we do with them? Okay, simply, I mean, simply put, let's say we had a uniform survey in a particular region down to some level, which we have never done so far with polarization. I mean, uh, um, systematically, and in a particular region, we have never studied. And in that case, we'd be able to tell if there's better connection. Like, for example, when uh, the, the, the correlations that chat has shown and with low mass star formation and, well, with everything and with, with high mass star formation with uh, Qi Zhou Zhang at SMA, they're all, again, a much sample. Like, it's just you know the brightest things you look, you look for in different regions. But when we go down to a much more systematic study in, let's say, a particular selected region and just study that to a great depth, then you'll be able to tell if there are any correlations between magnetic fields versus outflows, magnetic fields versus geometry, I mean, things like that, right? I mean, between shapes. Those are the sort of things we don't know well yet. And I think the answers are there, and Alma will be providing them in the future. But I think we need more, is my So would my a question thought. that could be answered that way be the following? Do magnetic fields actually control outflows? Yeah, magnetic fields control outflows. Is there a connection between magnetic field geometry and the cloud shapes and structures? I mean, on, on finer scales. I mean, we look at large scales, and we can see you know, connection between you know, magnetic field per per perpendicular mm -hmm. uh, to dense gas and parallel to diffuse gas. But then when we go down to really fine scales, like you know, hundreds of AU, what's the connection? I think for that, we need the systematic study. And I mean, with disks, we are finding more issues. But I'm just like thinking more in terms of you know, objects that have not yet formed you know, disks, where there's still enough of an envelope mass. Is that's my feeling. OK, other, uh, yes, oh. Please, gentlemen, Paolo. <laughs> oh, with microphone, yes, right, good point. I, ah, yes, we have a gentleman here handling microphones. Good point. I mean, uh, just to answer one of uh, Ram's question, we have done preliminary work on the ACA, and the results are very encouraging. So hopefully, we think that we may be able to put a check mark on the ACA soon. So that, that may allow 
uh, large mapping with ALMA. But I cannot promise. I mean, I just, just can say that the results are encouraging. So the, the thing that I, I, I mean, just uh, thinking on, on, on the same subject, uh, what we need are the missing length scales between Planck and ALMA. And initiatives like the JCMT are, are very good initiatives because we need the sensitivity. And the previous work done uh, by the SMA, Karma, and BIMA were good because we, we, got lar we, we got larger length scales, but the sensitivity was not good. I mean, we, we, we just got blobs. So we need, we need large scale mapping at those length scales to be able to connect and try to understand how the magnetic field is doing from really the large scales to the actual core sizes. And so on the same scope, uh, I want to put a question. At which scales are we actually losing magnetic flux? Because if, if you look at the magnetic flux on a molecular cloud and you compare to the flux on a star, to form a star, we need to be losing magnetic flux. So when that's actually happening? OK, yes, yes, please. OK, so I just wanted to say that I think there's going to be um, a huge increase in the amount of polarization data and the scales that are being probed over the next couple of years. So I'm going to be talking in, I guess, about an hour about blast pole and blast TNG polarimetry, which is upcoming. But there, we should actually be able to you know, sort of bridge the gap in spatial scales covered between Planck and ALMA. Right? We'll cover all those intermediate scales. So there's going to be a huge range of polarization data that's coming soon, which will give these incredibly detailed um, portraits of magnetic field structure in molecular clouds. But I mean, the polarization data is really um, only usable if you have models to compare it to. Right? So it, you, you try to make these statistical measurements and you compare them to, to, to simulations. So I say another thing that we might want to consider is that um, you know we have I've seen all these great simulations, um, and it would be really nice to compare the kind of uh, things that we're finding with these simulations. So we it might be useful to think of you know kind of easier ways to create synthetic observations for for more of these models so that we can more easily compare to um, our results to the physics in in different models. Okay. And then I also had a question um, that I think would be interesting to discuss. So given that um, we're seeing evidence of scattering in uh, the disk observations in, um, that we've seen so far in, in ALMA in a lot of cases, um, if we want to understand the role that magnetic fields are playing in disks, is, that, is, is there a way that we can approach that with, with ALMA, for instance? Um, through, I don't know, through like Zeeman measurements? Are there certain orientations of the disk where scattering uh, would not be such a problem? Are there certain wavelengths that we could look at where um, we could still actually see what the magnetic field geometry is in the disk? Uh, let's see. Oh, OK. Uh, go for it. Sure. One of the ways uh, to uh, deal with this uh, polarization scale of scattering is uh, to look at the um, circular polarization because uh, if you have aligned grains and you have um, um, uh, scattering, you can create uh, a unique signatures of um, polarized uh, circular polarized uh, light. So this is, uh, I think, way to answer your question. Are you saying there's a way to distinguish on that basis polariza linear polarization based on yes. scattering from linear polarization based on Yes, uh, yes, yes. And uh, it, uh, I actually know a couple of works on that. It's somewhat, I was feeling somewhat discouraged, not that I do this particular uh, uh, work myself, but I'm feeling somewhat discouraged about linear polarization studies if when you observe the linear polarization structure of a star forming region, you can't be sure what fraction of the polarization comes from scattering and what fraction comes from aligned grains, then your interpretation just becomes very difficult. But uh, for example, in comets, it's uh, really impossible to explain circular polarization uh, if it's uh, not uh, scattering on aligned grains just not possible. And uh, also, this should be uh, the case for the accretion disks. OK. Uh, Paolo threw out a question, and the question being at what, at what uh, scales 
uh, is the magnetic flux lost? Uh, does anyone have any thoughts about how you would try to answer that question by existing or uh, future observations? Uh, okay. So one thing we've done is the, with SMAs, we try to do these, I mean, uh, uh, Joseph Mikkel alluded to it a little bit. So we try to do some polarization observations of disks uh, with extremely high sensitivity. This was more evolved objects, maybe class one, class two almost. In those cases, we saw nothing, absolutely zero polarization. And we went down to like 0.1% uh, but polarization sensitivity. It was, it was very high sensitivity, and we spent a lot of time on it, and we saw nothing. And I mean, Alex was obviously in one of those papers, and with models and stuff, we saw nothing in that case. So it's, it's telling us that by the time we get to those that we are not seeing any polarization. So I don't know what that means for, so, so maybe that's too late. By the time we get to class two, there may be a problem in the sense that we couldn't I mean, we had barely enough resolution, so it could be there's some complicated structure that we're averaging out. So I think by that time, so it looks to me that more is, you know, by the, I think most of the stuff is in the envelope. I think that's probably what we can look at for, in terms of magnetic fields. So I think when you come to disks, things become, I mean, you might see polarization, but it might be due to some other effects. So most of the magnetic flux, I mean, the question you asked is where, where is the magnetic flux? And I think, I think by the time you go from envelope to disk, is it, it starts to get, I think, too late. Could I add to this? Uh, okay, sure. I believe that it's uh, important uh, to have uh, the comparisons which are based on the theory. And there are this uh, theory of uh, bipolar diffusion, which uh, suggests something. And there is also reconnection diffusion, although I did not want to talk about that. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, to talk uh, about reconnection diffusion, yeah. Alex, but see if you can. Get over that hangout. Yeah, okay? I, uh, I'm uh, transfixed. I'm sorry, uh, and uh, I, we have uh, this uh, predictions, and uh, uh, it is re really important uh, to uh, maybe have uh, um, the observations which will be focused on uh, um, finding the signatures. Mm -hmm. We have the signatures. Other comments about. Uh potentials for studying linear polarization and answering specific questions that uh, such studies can uh, can address. Uh, Edith, did you? Uh, something I would like to come back to what you said, Paolo. The, there is this, uh, for the goldrash kilafis effect, there is this ambiguity of uh, pi over two uh, for the uh, polarization direction, which and this depends on the relative orientation of the uh, exciting the, the the exciting radiation, the the velocity field gradient for for the CO line. Well, when for of the line, the velocity gradient in the molecules that control the radiative transfer. So uh, I think in the, in the case of uh, protostar, well, the, all that we have seen this morning, the, these are study cases to, to study that, and, and uh, it, it, it would be very much uh, useful to, to improve uh, uh, on these studies, to, to disentangle the effects of uh, an, an isotropy of the radiation, <laughs> the, the radiation field. And, uh, but I'm not working on that, so maybe it's untractable. Yeah, you sort of stole the question from me. I mean, the, the comment. I was going to say something Same similar. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, no. Uh, so the, the good thing about the Gold of Kilafis effect, and in principle, any molecule may show some small amount of linear polarization. And we can use that to use a sort of a topography you see, for example, different tracers to get trying to get an idea of uh, what the magnetic field is doing at those densities from the molecularly polarized emission. And in fact, this is an old idea from Dick uh, that that he he pushed the idea forward when I was a grad student. So it's also it's also part of his legacy. And and I think that this is something that is not really is is hasn't uh, diffused into the community. And now that Alma 
open the, 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 spectral, the, the spectral resolution domain, that's something that can be tried. Uh, yes. Just to go back a little bit, um, one comment on uh, <clears throat> what you said, Tom, about the, the problem of having both scattering and dust emission. I only learned a little bit about this at a conference a couple of years ago, but <laughs> folks in the far infrared or mid infrared, I think it's Canary Cam, have been doing modeling of this for a long time, trying to separate the, uh, the scattering from the emission polarization. So I think that will be kind of a cottage industry in the, in the future. If the really, really high resolution scales truly are allowing radio astronomers to enter the world of dust analysis via scattering polarization, which may well be the future, to, I want to ask again Laura's question, I don't know what the answer is to it, but has anybody done a back of the envelope sensitivity feasibility estimate of getting a Zeeman detection from a disk with ALMA resolution? Or are we going to have to resort to such crazy things as you know Faraday rotation of background sources through disks to get actual <laughs> estimates of Good magnetic luck fields? A background source. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there's there's got to be. Uh, sorry, were you saying there, you're not what? Yeah, I'm going to get a background source. Okay. Cool. Then what about the Zeeman question? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I haven't. Is anybody? <laughs> Anyone else? Dick. Yes. <laughs> Dick. It's a question for Dick. Well, uh, I, I I looked into that a little bit. Um, there's several problems. Uh, you need a, a species like CN, and CN has been detected in such disk, but it, it appears the lines are more optically thick than they are in, um, in more distributed regions, which is a problem. And also, um, in disk, you, you have, tend to have you know, rotation and velocity gradients, which is also a, a problem. But if you just look at the raw line strengths and, and line widths, um, with ALMA, you can get down to a few milligauss. And uh, uh, I, I think some of the models would say that you should be able to detect it, the Zeeman effect at that level. Dick, Dick, since you have the microphone, and we only have a few more minutes, I'd like to have you pose the question you posed to me, <clears throat> to me about the relationship between magnetic field strength and density and different theoretical uh, predictions. I made reference to that at the beginning of the session, but I think you would be able to pose the question. Well, I can ask clearly. the question again. I actually talked about it with Chris McKee just before this started. Is um, there were. There was a talk this afternoon which uh, was based on simulations which suggested that B scaled is roughly rho to the one half. And then Chris's talk uh, earlier had the simulations yielding B goes as rho roughly to the two thirds. Um, and uh, so the question is why do the different simulations yield such different results? And is, is, it, is uh, there something really fundamental that one can infer about the physics? if one can pin down what that um, relationship is. So I don't know, maybe you want to give the same answer you did to me earlier. Yeah, well so far uh, we, we've actually analyzed the data in uh, complementary ways. So in the work that I did with Pak Shing Lee and uh, Richard Klein, we attempted to emulate the observations as much as possible so that uh, as I mentioned, we actually identified clumps of the 100 most massive clumps in our simulation. And then uh, following Dick's advice, we uh, quote unquote observed them using a beam that was generally uh, significantly smaller than the size of the clump because the Zeeman observations always are made at the uh, inner regions. But we were not doing this on a point by point basis, obviously. We're now in integrating through a beam that goes all the way through <coughs> A, uh, a clump, but in the, the uh, inner part of it, and then averaged over the uh, uh, field. The other thing is that uh, we made a, uh, uh, we calculated both what the field that uh, would be observed uh, as uh, predicted, which is the mass weighted field, and then we averaged that over uh, in the actual calculating, as I mentioned in my talk tomorrow, and calculating the mass to flux ratio, uh, theoretically, you're not interested in the mass weighted field, you want the volume weighted field, or actually area, because you're calculating the flux is area weighted, 
and those turn out uh, to be different. So it could turn, uh, in the terms of the difference between what we did and what uh, Philip did, uh, as I said, we tried to emulate the observations. We are integrating along the line of sight through a clump, and we are taking the mass-weighted field. Philip, as I understand it, did a point-by-point -point, uh, determination of the relationship, and we have not tried that. We'll uh, try to do that to, in order to make a more direct comparison of his results. Is uh, Philip here? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, so I don't have too much more to add to that, actually. It's something that Chris and I discussed yesterday, so our, our analysis technique is, is different. I'm plotting the phase space of all the gas, which um, lies more close to the road to the uh, one half correlation, but as you can see, some of the gas actually does lie on the road to the um, two thirds um, correlation. And so if you if you do some averaging of gas properties over a larger scale, um, like say 0 0.01 parsec scales, then you could actually bias your slope um, to steeper values than one half. Uh, yes, we have another about another three. We have about three more minutes before we have to begin with the last afternoon session. So maybe uh, time for one more comment. Uh, thanks. Well, I'll, I'll reiterate a point I probably made that uh, since we know from observations that the turbulent line width, when it's non-thermal, is an important part of the correlation. That is, you get a, the correlation is between magnetic field, line width, and density then particularly if you're running a turbulent simulation, I think it would be worthwhile to measure the internal turbulence in your clumps and put that into the correlation as well and see what you get. I think when you know there very likely are at least three variables correlated, you're better off looking at all three rather than just two. I think we have, we can go over, back to Chris and then uh, over here. I think that will take care of the time we have available. Yeah, yes. uh, so we actually looked at that on our simulation in order to see whether we could Im improve the correlation. Uh, and it, uh, because as you know, there's an exact uh, relationship that you can derive between the magnetic field, uh, the uh, square root of the density, and the line width, as you said. And the, there's a coefficient in there, the virial parameter. And so each of those, all those things can vary with density. And when we looked at them, we did not find that uh, we could uh, get, for example, that the line width varied as the density to the one sixth power, which would then have changed the one half to the two thirds. It was more complicated. Okay, you have the last word. Um, oh, oh, <laughs> all right, second to the last. Okay, all right, fine. <laughs> so uh, I want to bring uh, it uh, one one topic, maybe different. Oh, uh, is uh, of the major topic of the conference, but it's very very important. Uh, it's uh, about the what we can do for the uh, CMB community in the hunt for B mode polarization signal. So the major obstacle for B mode hunting is the uh, polarization of uh, dust emission. And what they really want is we can provide them the accurate frequency dependence of polarization uh, of dust emission. And uh, so far, uh, we, we don't have a such uh, accurate uh, polarization spectrum. Uh, and uh, it's really needed. Okay, Enrique has the very last word. Now, <laughs> Enrique is a man of very few words, by the way. So uh, I'll, I'll try to live up to that. Over to him. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I just wanted to say that I, actually, now that we've seen so many turbulence, dr driven turbulence simulations, I would like to insist that in this picture that the clouds are globally collapsing. What we see as turbulence is not really random turbulence that opposes the motions. So in that sense, uh, it is also really fundamental to try to look for tests as to whether uh, the structures are formed by the competition between turbulence and gravity or just from large scale motions that are uh, driven by gravity from the largest scales. In that case, uh, the whole idea of turbulence uh, fighting gravity is, is, is not appropriate. And so I just wanted to make the point that driven turbulence simulations may be off uh, in that very hypothesis that the turbulence 
is uh, somehow random and enough to support the, uh, the weight of the gas. Well stated, Henrique. Thank you very much.